Fiddle Studio podcast, featuring tunes and stories from the world of traditional music and fiddling. I'm Meg Wobis Beller, and today I'll be bringing you a setting of the tune Branda and Bills by Jenna Moynihan and Mari Campbell from the album One Two. Hello, everyone. I hope you are well. Today we're going to be talking to Jenna Moynihan. Jenna plays Scottish fiddle, but also a lot of other kinds of fiddle. I pulled a quote from Daryl Anger, who called her one of the best of new generation of freestyle fiddlers. So that gives you some idea. She lives in Boston. She teaches fiddle at the Berklee College of Music that she attended as a student (laughs) some years ago. And she also teaches around. You'll find her at camps and weekends. And she has albums Ah, I could go on and on. She collaborates with all sorts of famous folks, Owen Marshall, Daryl Anger, Hanukkah Castle. You were just down in my area with Hanukkah and and Keith Murphy. I know. Yeah. Welcome, Jenna. Thank you. Hey, Meg. Great to be on your amazing podcast. Oh, thank you. So uh, Jenna and I have kind of a cute meet story. We do. Because I was at the String House which is where I purchased my violin in Rochester, New York, uh, owned by the Kanak family. And there was a teenager fiddling, trying out bows in another room. And I was drawn (laughs) like a moth to the flame. I was like, who is playing in there? Right? Do you remember? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I remember. Actually, I still, that's still the bow. I used that bow that I got that day. Oh, nice. Um, She was fiddling. She sounded really good. And I immediately was like, hey, can I get you to come to my camp? Can you come and help out with the kids? And we like, you came that next year, I think. You were about to leave for college. Yeah, that summer. Yeah. Yes, I was 18. That was my first real, uh, real camp teaching at. And I knew in like just the world to be a little smaller that meet cute was you had given my cousin Suzuki lessons for a time yeah um years ago so I knew that you existed and I knew <laughs> that there was this like a fiddle player in in the Rochester area but I had never met you and and it was great because sometimes you know if I go in a classical kind of or you know there's like the connect shop where I've also gotten my instruments and bows and then you go in and play fiddle tunes sometimes I'm like oh man they're probably I don't know. Just someone walks in and they're like, (laughs) what is this character up to? But just having someone be like, yeah, fiddle was awesome. (laughs) I was excited. (laughs) I was too. Yeah. If you can, can you kind of fill us in on, so that was, you were 18 and going off for Mm -hmm. Berkeley. So what happened before that, that brought you to be playing fiddle and getting ready to embark and studying it so deeply. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I just started taking Suzuki violin lessons. I think I was seven or just about seven. I had really wanted to play the violin, but my parents at worst first sort of like, well, we have a piano and your older siblings are playing the piano, so it's time for your piano lessons. And it was just a no thank you from me. And then there was only one violin teacher in the town. So I, in the town I grew up in, which is Lakewood, New York. And so I was on a waiting list for a little while. And I finally got got in with uh, a wonderful teacher named Sue Tillotson. And kind of by chance getting into the fiddle stuff. A couple years after that, she was getting into fiddle tunes, Scottish tunes. Someone had given, I think someone had given her a CD, maybe a book. with, And so she was finding those tunes exciting and sharing them with us. And then a few of us, us being the children <laughs> of the Suzuki school, were really excited, you know, really loved it. And I remember going to a Highland Games, I was nine or eight and doing a fiddle workshop with a then teenage Jeremy Kittle. And so, you know, learning tunes. I think we had learned some tunes ahead of time. We learned some tunes when we were there in the workshop. And that was just like, you know, fireworks for me. And and <laughs> yeah, that was it. Kind of, I loved, loved it. Loved the tunes. So that's, it does seem like it's just kind of by chance 
like so many things, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So then, I mean, we had this small community that was really spearheaded and nourished by my Suzuki teacher, Sue. And we'd have a little fiddle club. We'd go to workshops if they were within some striking distance. And that was the case for a few years. And then I started going to fiddle camps. And that was a, another kind of big firework moment of yeah, getting to be kind of at the feet of all my heroes and learning from them and meeting a bunch of other kids my age and, and all that who were excited about the music. What kinds of camp? The first camp that I went to, I was 12. It was a it was a big birthday present, a big surprise. Um, I was just enamored with Natalie McMaster. Still am, still am. But uh, yeah, just, uh, 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 there was just, when I see, quick aside, when I see sort of like the hype and fandom around Taylor Swift, I get it because that is how I felt about Natalie McMaster when I was 12 years old. I just, I could go on. It's another podcast. So she, my dad had found out that she was teaching at a camp in San Diego, um, Mark O'Connor's fiddle camp. So that's how I ended up going there. Going there, I totally had tunnel vision. I wasn't really interested in what anybody else was doing except for Natalie McMaster. <laughs> um, but it was a multi-style, multi-genre camp and all kinds of great folks that I met for the first time. And and then from then on, it was just, I went there a couple more times. I went to Swannanoa in North Carolina. I went to uh, Valley of the Moon, Alistair Fraser's camp up up through um, high school and then going to college. So going to those camps was really huge for me. I really only got to do like one a summer because they were always far away. There was <laughs> nothing was ever close or easy to get to for me, but hugely inspirational and encouraging. Yeah. So I get, yeah, that's, I've rambled, but I think I've pretty much gotten to being, you know, 18 and then, and then going to college. Yeah. Camps, CDs, workshops, listening to my recordings that I made at the camps, all those things got me through every year until I got to go to the next thing, next camp. And was your focus Scottish fiddle specifically? Yeah, that, that was my, yes, that was what I started doing, learning Scottish tunes. I did a couple Scottish fiddle competitions when I was just starting with it. But, you know, Natalie McMaster was a huge influence, of course, Kate Breton, which is very similar and yeah. has a lot of, um, it, it, they translated right to each other. But, but yeah, I mean, first that was the thing that was what I what had the most access to, I guess, to begin with. And that's not to say like I was also playing some Irish, you know, tunes that are just claimed by everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and I would go to sessions, like sometimes when I would come up to Rochester, for a family event, uh, I'd go to a session or I'd go to a session in Erie, Pennsylvania. That was kind of more Irish, but maybe since we were kids, they let us play our Scottish tunes in the sessions. <laughs> just encourage us. Um, only kids. Only allowed. kids, exactly. They're just like, oh, look at them go. Why are they playing to Stras Bay here? Um. <laughs> <laughs> so Scottish fiddle, you're the first Scottish fiddler. I know you play more styles now. For people who really maybe only know about Irish or old time fiddle, what is Scottish fiddling? What makes it different? I know some times I'll listen to a Scottish fiddler and a lot of what I hear will sound like Irish, but there are definitely, there's a different kind of rhythm and vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Yes. So Scottish fiddle, you're right. Like they're, I think from the outside, if you're hearing an Irish tune and a Scottish tune back to back, it's kind of hard to tell the difference. And I remember not really being able to tell the difference for a while as I was learning because they're so similar. There's definitely rhythms that are a little bit different. I think the most, one of the most obvious differences is uh, in Scottish music, there's the Scotch snap, which is where you'll definitely hear it in a Strass Bay type of tune, type of dance tune that's very... Da 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 And actually, I mean, you can hear that rhythm a lot in like pop music now too. The Scottish snap. It's it's on the radio. We've made it. The Scottish fiddle is also, you know, influenced by the Highland bagpipes, 
Whereas, of course, there's bagpipes and Irish music, slightly different, different tuning, different notes, all the, you know, so they're emulating a similar thing, but then the nuance in that is very specific. Of course, once you get in the weeds with it, I actually, yeah, the, my friend Hanukkah, a great Scottish fiddle player, she's, I've heard her describe Scottish music and Irish music being, you know, quite similar to the landscapes of each of these places. So, mm. you know, Irish music, you think of like these like rolling hills and, oh, this is a terrible example. And then, uh, but Scottish music being like jagged, like, you know, there's like rocky cliffs. Da, 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 da. That's a totally broad example. But yeah, the way the melodies are also flowing sometimes is different. But within that, there are tunes, yeah, that are played by both styles and both of them claim them. Yeah. Or there's a tune that's a Strass Bay in Scotland, but it's a real in Ireland, but it's the same tune. Yeah. It's a mess. <laughs> so you went to Berkeley out of this Scottish background, doing these camps for many years. And I guess what I'm most curious about your experience there was just, it sounds like you were playing a lot of tunes that were given to you by other people and in a style that you were learning from different teachers. So I think somebody who listened to you now would find your playing really unique. So somewhere in there, you kind of moved away from other people's tunes and kind of other people's exact ways of playing and you found your own voice. I'm curious, is that something you feel like happened at Berkeley or happened afterwards? Mm. It's so unique how you play the fiddle. <laughs> yeah, I think probably both. So I went, I, I wanted to study, play music in, in school. I wanted to keep going with music. And I was also really excited about living in a place where there was just, you know, in a city that had a great scene for trad music or yeah, acoustic music in general. So even if I hadn't gone to Berkeley, I, I was thinking like, well, my gosh, may, maybe I'll just go somewhere in Boston or end up in Boston. Or, you know, for a little while, I thought about going to like Scotland or, you know, something so that part of it was a big draw and it was something that I had, uh, yeah, I think uh, I was really ready for to be immersed in in it. So, but for me, Berkeley was one of the places, one of the few places at the time, uh, maybe it's changed a little bit now, but where I could go and not go to a conservatory or not have to be trying to play classical music, which is not... Uh, Nobody needed to hear that. But oh yeah, there wasn't, I didn't go there to study Scottish fiddle and I did, or Celtic fiddle even. By chance, the year that I started, which was 2009, that was the first year of something called the American Roots Music Program, which was started by Matt Glazer at Berkeley. And so that was the focus on, yeah, all these bluegrass, old time, blues, certainly, yeah, Celtic music. Um that big umbrella of Berkeley kind of saying like, we value this. We are going to like put energy into this. And at that time already, a bunch of great fiddle players had already gone through Berkeley and more were coming and, and, and not just fiddle players, banjo, you know, there's like, you can study banjo there. You can study the mandolin. But again, that was just when I arrived, I didn't actually know that that was a thing when I had applied and, and all that. So that gave me access to unexpected access, you know, to bluegrass and old time particularly, and in general, improvisation, which was new to me. So I spent the, the time that I was there, I was there for four years, and it was doing a lot of things that I wasn't comfortable doing. I didn't think I would be doing necessarily and being influenced by a lot of things that hadn't even been on my radar, which I think is probably for the best, you know, like you think you have this plan or you think you like know what you're going to do. And then it's not that. Um, mm. So I, yeah, I mean, I took a lot of lessons with Bruce Molsky, like just learning all time, learning all time Boeings. And it wasn't, none of this was like intentional, like, but it all just, it just seeps into how I was thinking about music or how I was playing music or how I was phrasing something. And 
I'm glad that it was actually, you know, I think I would have had a really different experience if I went and just somehow studied the thing that I already knew that I liked. Because at the end of the day, I think I still, the Scottish Celtic fiddle lens is still kind of how I um, experience music and that's, or how I create music. I think that's kind of always the strongest voice that I have, but I, yeah, I was exposed to a bunch of other things and I have tried to do them as authentically as I can when I'm learning them. And then of course, when I'm playing, I'm not necessarily putting on a hat and trying to be like the most traditional whoever fiddle player or from wherever tradition. Cause I'm an, I'm, I didn't grow up in a tradition, which I always was sad that I, you know, or I always wondered like, what if I had just been, I don't know, born in Cape Breton or something, but I wasn't. And so I've always, you know, I'm always kind of an outsider to these traditions too, to a point. It's interesting. I think a lot of people, the music that's coming out of them is some kind of mixture of like whatever their roots, their old habits, their old like grooves, but then also more recent found myself just kind of the music that I've been playing and hearing over the last year has a big influence. And yet I'll always sound like that little kid playing um, Portland Fancy and Chorus Jig, New England. I can't really sound not New England. If I play an Irish tune, they're like, sounds, yeah, you, you almost have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, if I, it, yeah, if I play an old time tune, it's still like, Hmm, what was that? What was that little thing you did in there? Because it's like, diddly do. Yeah, I think it's also great to be like rooted in something. I mean, especially now we can be, we can hear and have access to so many styles of music that even with like streaming music or YouTube, those things weren't happening when I was growing up playing. Yeah. And so it meant that I had the CDs that I had. I knew about the people I knew about and you go to a camp and you're exposed to new things, but that's kind of, I wasn't really exposed to that many new things beyond like that one week a year or, you know, but there's something to be said for going really deep yeah. with uh, sometimes scarcity of what you have, I think can be a strength. And for a long time, that was, I, I think that that was kind of the case. I'm glad that I always had that touchstone to return to Rather than just like, oh, anything is possible, you know, because everything is possible. And that's to me completely overwhelming <laughs> and will freeze me out to do something if everything is. Yeah. I, I imagine that probably is like for some folks could be very inspirational. But for me, it's just a panic room. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, I, it's funny when I would stream all my music, I had like a echo or something. I found myself not listening to a wide variety. And so we threw that out. We just used the record player. And because I have my parents' old record collection and also my kids get records, I listen to a much more variety of music. Yeah. It's so interesting. Whereas before I had the world at my fingertips, but I just didn't know where to go with it. So it's too much, I think. And yeah, just like learning all of a record is, Mm. is cool. What's a record you learned all of? Oh, so many. I mean, all of Natalie McMaster's in my hands. My roots are showing live, both discs. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had the Blaze and Fiddles, the first two Blaze and Fiddles records. <laughs> I love them so much. I think yeah, they are, if you haven't heard those, there's so many good tunes on those records. Hmm. I was learning like all of Wild Asparagus, like everything yes. Becky Tracy. I think I, you know, I was sitting there just writing the tunes out and playing along with the thing. I was obsessed. Yes. And it's, it's great to emulate what you love for a long time. Like that's how it ends up kind of being natural or like, oh, where does, where does this ornament, I've learned how to make this ornament, but I don't know where to put it. Hmm. I mean, I think for, and for me, I'm just like such a, it's all feel, it's all feeling like I have, like if I feel great about that sound or that track, like I'll listen to one track for days and days and days. Yeah. It's not really like, Oh, I should learn. I should do this. I I don't do, I don't don't do anything when when that's how I feel, but it's just like the emotion of whatever that track or whatever that player 
makes me feel and just sinking really deep into that. And then it starts to be like, yeah, you get to take and be inspired by that kind of flourish or that kind of, I don't know, hearing someone play with dynamics and th- and then it just, it's not in, it's not as calculated. Okay. And now I'm going to do that here, but it just seeps in. And it's, I think that's how this music is supposed to be passed on anyway, right? You hear it, someone plays it and you think you're kind of playing it like them, but you're not, you're playing it like you influenced by them to some point. And it's an amazing moment when you figure out that the music that really moves you emotionally or that really sparks you, that you can do that. You know, when I see a student and they're playing something or learning how to do something and they're playing the chords behind it, they hear that like minor sub and they're like, oh, you know. (laughs) Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. I mean, it's hard to find or finding your own voice doesn't just like I don't know. It's not just like, oh, there we go. Now I I just decided that I would have my own voice and now I have it. It's not, it's a long following what you care about or what makes you feel that feeling of hearing music. I mean, it's like, yeah, I don't know how to describe the feeling, but I think everybody knows. Yeah, that's what you should follow. I mean, that's, there's no guidebook exactly, except for like what you like and then see if you can get even deeper with what you like and then it will probably lead you somewhere else that you didn't know that you were gonna go yeah well jenna i of course saw you teaching many years ago 15 20 it was a while yeah and you were great back then the kids loved you and i've seen you teaching recently and so i know that you're around (laughs) teaching a lot and you teach at berkeley what do you teach there i'm at berkeley i'm teaching i teach private lessons and I'm teaching a Celtic ensemble. Nice. And where else can people, if they're interested in working with you, like where can they find you normally? Do you have like camps you usually do or what's coming up this summer? Yeah. Well, my website is a great place to find information and I have a newsletter, which comes very infrequently, which will say much of the same information on my website. The website is jennamoynihan.com. It sure is. I'll be, yeah, I'll be at Swananoa Celtic Week. I'll be some, yeah, other camps. I play a lot with Seamus Egan Project. I play with Hanukkah Castle. I do all kinds of stuff. Hopefully kind of working on another album slowly for myself. Yeah. How's that? Slowly. It is slow, but it's coming. I mean, it's been almost 10 years since I made my other solo record, but I do so much playing in other people's projects. Yeah. I wondered specifically about that because I see that you do a lot of things Mm -hmm. and collaborate with singers and bands and other musicians. I was curious, especially since you say that your album is coming slowly, like how you balance working on other people's music and also like finding time to work on your own music. Yeah, I would say that... (laughs) Up until more recently, I probably really wasn't balancing it because I wasn't really doing it much. I love playing in other projects and I love collaborating and I love being a side person and playing with like I I do. But I was also finding that I would get home from one of those things or get home, you know, from a big expulsion of energy uh, doing something and I wouldn't have any energy left or I wouldn't want to come and, and try to write something or all that. And yeah, and the pandemic for me was not a time of creativity at all. I know for some people it was. And Same. Yeah. I mean, I so <laughs> envy those people. Uh, but I will, I will tell you that it was not. I played a lot. I taught a lot and I did kind of different things, but it was not, it was not flowing. Hmm. So I feel like I lost some time there. And I also, and then I was injured actually a, a part of last year. So I lost some time there, hmm. which now gives me a little bit more of like a, appreciation for my own time and my own what I what I want to do so I'm I'm working on it and I just have I've learned now I think that I have to carve out the time and protect that time which might mean saying no to something that I would like to do whatever it is yeah life is long and (laughs) also short (laughs) it depends on how you look at it yeah well I went I went 20 years between albums I mean so there you go there you go. I know. I used to joke and say like, 
maybe in the pandemic, I would just be like, oh yeah, 2025 is going to be my year. Just joking. And then I'm like, well, I guess right now I am, it's looking like 2025, I hope. I don't know. I've made a lot of other music in that time. Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) Sometimes it's, like you said, flowing and sometimes it's not. I didn't think I would ever write music again. And then all of a sudden I had to, but I I really had to carve the time out. Like I took one day a week and actually like Mm. traveled away from my family for that day. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yeah. That's important. I mean, you'd think music would be more important than laundry, but in the moment you're like, well, then I have to do this laundry for me. I have three kids. Yeah. Oh, totally. (laughs) I know. I have no kids and yet I still... I will let other things, not other, not if it's someone else's, if I'm learning something for someone else, I will do that. Like I will, that's the priority. But when that shifts, it is funny how easy it is to like, yeah, let everything else go first. And if you let everything go first, bad news, you're never gonna, there's no end to the to-do list, I think, of life. Yeah. Yeah. Took me a long, yeah. I mean, I'm still learning it. Take no prisoners. This is my, (laughs) this is my time. Well, we have a tune. We do have a tune. For today. Yes. And this album was just mentioned at my session. I think I think they were talking about the impressive siblings of the Campbell family. Mm. And they mentioned Mari and they were like, and she's on an album with Jenna Moynihan. I was like, oh, I know who that is. So I guess the album is called One, Two, and you play f- fiddle and Mari plays harp. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How how did you guys come to start working together? Um, we met at Berkeley, actually. Okay. So there you go. I guess we had a couple of mutual friends in Scotland. So, you know, someone had reached out and said, uh, oh, Mari's come, you know, I was going to start in Boston. She started, I think my, yeah, my last year was her first year. So we were aware of each other and just started playing tunes casually. And then actually we rehearsed for a kind of like a kind of background music gig that we got, you know, that was the first corner. Exactly. In the corner where we had had a reason to come up with some things. And, and that was that. And then just lots more collaborating over the next several years. And that's where we met. Yeah. Well, the tune is called Brenda and Bills. Did you write it together or did you write it? How does it work when you... Yeah, we wrote it together. How does it work when you write it together? Um, I think in this case, we knew that we wanted a tune that that felt like this and we didn't have one that we already knew. So usually first we would think about some tune that we already knew. And it, I mean, it, I don't know how to explain because we there are a couple things that we wrote together on that record. Sometimes someone had a, has a phrase and we might just kind of play it like, meander together and Mari might be playing different harmonic ideas that also can really, you know, help the tune. Oh, okay, well, it could go there, which which had been helpful to me because I can get really locked into like one chord or like two chords and just, so, and then someone opening a door of, oh, then I'm like, okay, great. I can go there. And now there's a new melodic idea. Yeah. And sometimes it's been like, we, someone comes up with half the tune and then come up with the second half together or we're like here's this first phrase and then we might go off into other rooms and then come back and sort of like jam both of our ideas together or take this and take that Hmm. but with a kind of mutually kind of agreed upon mutually agreeing on like what we need Mm. somehow you know like somehow just looking for the same thing or looking for the same feeling um and then we would play it uh for 20 minutes and you know non-stop and just see if it's like is that right you know and maybe in that 20 minutes another little thing happens and you're like oh yeah and all of that time a lot of it would be recording on voice memo because of course something can go by and then it's gone forever <laughs> yeah um and this tune was written we had the tune before we had the name quite a long time before we had the name actually but we this album was recorded at a friend's house in New Hampshire came out in 2017. She had let us use her house. This kind of, she sort of had a gathering space. She did house concerts and it was a big, beautiful wooden room. And so we named it after our hosts who let us make our whole album there. Nice. 
What kind of tune is it? Is it a reel? It's probably a slow reel. <laughs> but yeah, I've never played it fast. I don't know what that would be like, but it's kind of like a, yeah, a groovy little, I don't even know what it is. I say slow reel, <laughs> but I would, if you think that it's something different, send me an email. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It sounded like that to me. Yeah. It's yeah. like one of those, Brenda and Bills is a slow reel. Change my mind. And then I set up a little booth and wait until someone <laughs> makes their argument, <laughs> makes their case for why it's a, <laughs> I don't know what. Well, we're going to listen to it. So we'll figure out what it is. And it's from the album One, Two. And that whole album is you and Mari? It's yep. all fiddle and just duo. Heart. Sweet. Well, so everyone should look for Jenna online at her website, Jenna Moynihan. And you're on Instagram too? Yeah, that's probably the most up-to-date social media okay. thing, thing. And the newsletter. Newsletter. Oh, sign up for the newsletter, you guys. <laughs> I get it. It's great. <laughs> it's just, it comes almost never. But when it does, sometimes I make you a playlist. Mm. Sometimes Ooh, I don't. And you get all the details. You get all the details. Yeah. Right to your door. <laughs> Sweet. Well, thank you so much for coming Thanks, on the podcast. Meg. Thank yeah. you for having me on your podcast and for having me at your fiddle camp. Oh. It was many, many years ago. Mm. Giving me a chance. <laughs> <laughs> really, it was, yeah, it was my first. It was, it was pretty awesome. Oh, you sounded good um, in that violin yeah. shop. <laughs> Thanks. I had to grab it was a good you. bow. It was a good bow. music for today's tune at fiddlestudio.com along with my books courses and membership for learning to fiddle i'll be back next week with another tune for you have a wonderful day